Hi, this is Irv Shapiro with the Dr. Vax channel. And today I'm going to present my conclusions about the Monoprice MP10 and whether I recommend it, who I recommend it to, and for what style of printing. Okay, stay tuned and let's learn something together. The slide deck that I'm looking at during this presentation and I'm presenting periodically on the screen is linked at the bottom of the presentation. It's the same slide deck that was used for the MP10 review and it has been updated with additional information and updated printer profiles. Let's take a look at big picture first. So what are the advantages of this printer? Well, the most significant advantage of this printer is it is big. You can print very big things. Now, this particular print would actually fit on an Ender 5, um, but you could print a vase that's almost twice this height. And so that's a significant advantage for a $400 printer. The next advantage for this printer is that it does have a mesh style bed leveling system. And a number of people have commented that they think this um, sensor is undersized, is not very accurate. Um, but I will tell you that I'm getting exceptional first layers after I properly configured the slicer for this printer. And I'll show you how to do that. So I think that's a significant plus for a printer in this price range. Um, the LCD is very good. It's very, very easy to use. It has a nice tune function. So since it is mesh bed leveling, you can live adjust the Z adjustment during your print. That makes it very easy to get a perfect first layer. Given its size, it's aggressively priced per square meter or millimeter of print area. It's 300 by 300 by 400. It's very easy to work on. Um, they've done a number of interesting things. There are belt tensioners that are easily accessible, and uh, we'll talk about that in a moment. And the hot end actually can be taken off. Now, with inside this cable, there are snap connectors, so you could disconnect the cables if you needed to. Um, this would make it very easy to take the hot end off to do maintenance, as an example, to replace the printer nozzle. So that is a unique advantage. I found no problem with that coming loose during prints. The cable management system on this printer is about the best of any printer I have. I have a Prusa MK3, I have an Ender 5. Um, this, the cable management is really, really good, well done. The only change I would make is they ran the Bowden tube inside this cable management system. I think that put too much tension on it. I think it's better off run outside. That's how they do it on the Ender 5. I um, believe that that's just a better overall approach. Next, this is basically a CR10 clone. It has enclosed electronics, so it's more like a CR... 10S Pro clone, um, but at the same time, since the frame is very similar, um, it would be possible to use a number of the upgrades, such as upgraded extruders, additional frame supports for this printer that you can get on a CR10. And finally, when printing at slow speeds, now that's a caveat. Um, I find that printing at a base speed of over 50 millimeters per second, the quality on this printer suffers. However, at slow speed, the quality is uh, quite nice, is really, really quite nice. And in fact, the first layer quality is as good as any printer I have with the exception of my Prusa, which is a little bit better. Now, what are the negatives? Well, the first negative is that the extruder that ships on this printer, that's not this extruder. It is a plastic extruder that looks very similar. It's the opposite. Instead of a left orientation, it's a right orientation, it's a left orientation as the Select Mini, and it is just not powerful enough to press a, to push the filament through this long Bowden tube into this all metal hot end. So therefore the stock printer under extrudes 
significantly, significantly. In my case, I upgraded the extruder. It's a very easy upgrade. There's a video, you can see a link to it. There's a video available to show you how to do that. The second disadvantage, there is a lack of documentation and most importantly, a lack of printer profiles. The printer profile that ships with it, I don't believe is well tuned. It's Windows only on Cura. That's why you see a uh, PC based, a Windows laptop here. This is the only Windows machine I own. It's literally a laptop I bought at Best Buy for $150 in the bin of return slightly used laptops. It is so slow that it takes about a minute and a half to start Cura, but it's enough for my purposes. So I created a custom Cura profile. We'll look at that in a moment. The print bed is large. And so just like the CR10s from Creality, it has a lot of mass. That means when it's moving back and forth, it vibrates the printer. That can cause layer shifts at higher speeds, which is one of the reasons for running it slower, and it can cause ghosting. So I've ordered a stabilizing kit, rods that will go from here to here, that are made for our CR10. I'm going to see if that will solve that problem. The menu system does have the ability to extrude um, and unload filament. However, it's much too aggressive. So you push the filament in manually, which is how you do it on most Bowden-based systems, till it gets to the extruder. Then you use the menu to continue the extrusion, and it's attempting to push the filament too fast, and it causes uh, the grinding effect that you sometimes see on an extruder. So it's just too aggressive. And finally, at least in my case, it required a lot of tinkering to get started. The assembly is very easy, but I did find I wanted to adjust the belts. Um, I, as I mentioned, I replaced the extruder, um, and I had to create my own profile. So if you were new to 3D printing, this is not the printer for you. If, however, you're looking for a large print area, you don't mind a little bit of tinkering, there's some very unique, interesting features on this printer that make it a good uh, additional printer for you to be using. Okay, let's go into some of the details now. Let's look now at some of the upgrades I've made to this printer. You'll notice this blue Bowden tube. This is a Capricorn Bowden tube. I mounted it on the outside. I did add a metal extruder, an all metal extruder, and I have an Octoprint OptiPry attached to it. This obviously isn't plugged in right now. That works great on this printer. I plugged it in, it recognized it immediately. I didn't have to add any plugins uh, for the printer protocol. And then finally, I have an $8 fluorescent LED, actually LED light, that I bought at a big box uh, craft store that I mounted on the top of this printer with just a couple cable ties. Now here's a couple tips for when you first assemble this printer. The first is that the Z access rod right here mounts right here on the printer with a couple plastic retaining clips. Do not be tempted to leave those retaining clips in place. Instead, remove them completely and screw the screws all the way down. Why? Because Depending on where they are, they will rub on your print bed a little bit, and it will make your print leveling inaccurate because it can't get to all the right places. It will also cause a terrible no noise if it stops the printer from moving freely. The second is when you assemble the printer, you might be tempted to run this cable in here. I did that initially. Bad idea, it will get caught on your print bed periodically and it will stop the print bed from moving freely. In fact, I ran it back here and it caused it to not move to the back position um, appropriately. The next thing to think about is in general, you're going to need to run this printer at a modest print speed. I'm still playing with it, but right now I find that 50 millimeters per second is a optimal, optimal speed. And we're going to see in a moment as we go through the Cura profile, 
you do not want to turn acceleration and jerk control on. So this is a very nice 3D Benchy. It has a little bit of a layer issue right here. Once again, I think that's because of the vibration on this printer. But other than that, it's almost identical to the 3D Benchy up from my Ender 5. Um, in fact, the print on the bottom is a little bit clearer. Um, there's a little less stringing on this printer than the Ender 5. However, all of these, these are 3D Benchies that I printed before I turned acceleration jerk control off. I couldn't figure out what was happening. It was failing at exactly the same layer every time, yet I had printed some really beautiful prints on this printer. So something about Cura and those two settings causes it to generate a sequence of G-code that moves the printhead in a way that causes a layer shift. So I have acceleration, optimization, and jerk control both off in my profiles. And finally, the concept of combing is very important. Now combing is where Cura will cause the printer to make non-print moves. That's when it's not extruding filament in an area that's already inside the model. So that if there's any stringing, you don't care. It's only that you, when there's stringing outside of the fill area that you care. However, there's some side effect with combing. And therefore, in order to get a decent first layer on this printer, in fact, this applies to my other printers also, you want combing to be configured so that it's not in skin. That means it doesn't do the comb when it's on the outside or the first layer, which is a skin layer, and a combing maximum before retraction of 15 millimeters. What that basically says is if you're going to move inside the model, let's say in the fill area, but you're moving more than 15 millimeters, retract anyways. I found with those two settings, my first layers were delightful. So this is a first layer print. Um, I'll be doing a video on this model came off a of Thingiverse. I think this is a first layer torture test. Um, it's hard to get this to print perfectly, uh, but these came off really very well once I used the profile that I'm going to show you now. Okay, let's go through this profile a bit together. Um, this first page, the actual uh, provisions for the printer has not changed from my initial setting on this profile. Uh, the start G code is my custom start G code. It puts a fairly wide um, index line across the front to ensure that the extruder is running properly. Um, that was more necessary when I had the plastic extruder on, uh, but I still think it's uh, worthwhile. You'll notice the layer height here is one is 0.175. That's the magic number for this printer. What is a magic number? Well, if you look at the stepper motor and you look at the screw um, scale, the actual screw indexing on the screw, that means that a full turn, a full step of your stepper motor will move a particular amount. That's an ideal step. Stepper motors can do micro steps. They can move less than a full step, but there's less accuracy. So that generates a, what's called a magic number, a multiple. 0.175, not 0.15, not 0.20, is a magic number layer height for this printer. In my ideal profile, um, that's used as the basis for the profile. Now, if we look at the material screens, you'll notice that I had the flow at 120 when I was using the plastic extruder. I have it here at 105. I've actually run it down as low as 101 or 102, depending on the print. Um, this Benji, as an example, I think was 101 or 102, and I don't see any under extrusion on here at all. Now, if we look at the print speed, you'll see that the top speed, the overall speed is set at 50. Initial layer is set up 20. That may be a little slower than I need to go. I might try moving it up to 25, but making it 35 or 40 does not work well on this printer. Now, as long as we're talking about the initial layer, let's talk about this print bed. I like this print bed. Um, it comes off very, very easily. 
It is fully flexible, but it doesn't always stick to prints when you lay down your first layer. I found the solution to that is Magic Goo. I just use a liberal amount of Magic Goo. What I really like about Magic Goo is that if you take just a damp cloth with water and you rub it over a surface that was Magic Goo, you can sort of make it tacky again. So I can use one application of Magic Goo for a number of prints. It washes off with plain water. It works very well. With a nice layer of Magic Goo, um, I'm able to get really beautiful first layer prints um, on this printer. Now, if we look at travel, you'll see that combing is set to not in skin and maximum combing distance before retraction is set to 15. Those are very important settings. Um, we do in the material section, we did have retraction on. Retraction was at 6.5 millimeters at a speed, I believe, of 25. Um, that works very, very well. Um, this is a very difficult model, this calibration model. I do have some stringing at the very top, but if I run the classic two-tower calibration model for stringing, I get zero stringing. Um, and there's really no stringing at all on models such as this 3D uh, Benji. Um, so these settings work, they work well. I do use Z-Hop on, but only over printed parts. Um, I find if you leave it on all of the time, it increases the stringing. And finally, here is the startup code. Now, this is not the time to go through this line by line. As I said, this will bring up the bed to temperature, the nozzle to temperature. It will print a nice index line or waistline across the front. Um, it will then zero everything out and go to the print. So my conclusion, great second printer, wonderful printer for someone with experience with printers that wants a large print area, enjoys working on the printer because it's very easy to get to the individual parts. This will be a perfect printer for me to experiment with different nozzle sizes because it's just easy to do. It is a very hackable printer because it's basically a clone of a CR10. And with an all-metal extruder and an enhanced Bowden tube, it is a solid printer. It may actually become a very good printer with additional stabilization. Okay, that's a wrap for the video today. And I hope you enjoyed this video, that you learned something. If you did, please like this video, share this video with others, subscribe to the channel, and let's continue to learn things together.